Well, good evening. Can you? Hear, is this on? You can hear me. Because I'm going to take the. Have, have you been hearing the the waves kind of uh, go across this? Uh, yeah. So we're going to turn that off, right? We got this one off, and this one's on. You got it. All right. So I, I just want to uh, encourage all of you before I give you four doses of reality, and uh, and as I give you those four doses of reality. Uh, hopefully leave you with some optimism on the fact that the reason I'm here in Texas is because I think that the path to really taking back our country uh, is largely dependent on what you do here in Texas. Uh, and I can say, uh, one, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I've, I've never been here before, uh, but you know, the board, if you want to have me back, I'd be glad to come back anytime. <laughs> Uh, I, I want to thank you, Greg, JB, obviously the board, for not only putting together this great event, but literally looking at TPPF in a way that is affecting not just the state of Texas, but the entire country. And I can say that because, you know, out of all the great testimonies that you've had, you know, I'm one of the few that has never worked for TPPF. I've never been on the board, uh, but we work very closely together. And this is uh, my second trip to Texas in less than a week, showing the importance of Texas. Now, I, I say that uh, because that's the good news. You know, the bad news is that if Texas doesn't perform, we're gonna have a real problem. And, and so with all the opportunities, Joe, you did a great job. I can tell you your, your ambassador wife was just incredible. I can say that from a chief of staff standpoint. She would call. She was actually advocating for her job. She did a, an unbelievable job, was very gracious. But when we look at the issues that Joe is bringing up about energy dominance, we have to get back to that, guys. And we have to quit playing nice while we embrace all these green new energy deals that sadly Joe Manchin sold out. He sold out the, his entire state of West Virginia. And, and he wants to say it's inflation reduction, but it had nothing to do with inflation. In fact, it will increase inflation in the short run. Uh, it had more to do with subsidies that directly attack the coal industry, the oil and gas industry, and, and John Kerry's out there celebrating it. But if he thinks that that's going to keep Joe Biden in the White House, Joe Biden was wrong. Glenn Youngkin didn't win the state of Virginia as a governor because of a climate deal. He, he won because what happened is, is parents all across the state of Virginia said they want something better for their schools and their students, and they want to be empowered again. That's what we need to do. We need to make sure that we do that here in Texas. And I'm here to give you a little dose of reality. You know, you got this fan here, and it reminds me a little bit of, of President Trump when he'd go out and do these, you know, there's... There's two jobs that you got to make sure you get right with President Trump. I just want to let you know that. One is the teleprompter. Now, he is the only guy that only uses half of the things on the teleprompter. And so the teleprompter is there going, and it's going, and the poor guy in the back is there saying, well, I think he's here, I think he's there, and he's running it up and down. And, and, uh, and so the guy, the sweat's breaking out on his forehead as he's trying to find the right teleprompter. And so the president will go off on a tangent telling this story or that story and then come back. And, and this guy, you know, he said, well, I think we can be right here. But here's the kind of president and President Trump we had. He could give a two-hour speech, go on and off. So the speech on the teleprompter was about 38 to 40 minutes. So if that gives you any indication about a two-hour speech, he could do that. But here was the problem, and the, the reason why the sweat would always break out on the, on the teleprompter, uh, the guy that ran the teleprompter's forehead. Because what would happen is the president almost memorized everything that's on the teleprompter. And so he would give the speech, and then he would get back in. Debbie and I, my wife of 43 years, is here uh, with me tonight. Uh, we got back in. 
we were in the beast, we get in the beast, and the president had just given his famous speech at CPAC. And you remember the one where he went out and hugged the flag and, you know, he was talking. So that one went on. I mean, he mentioned my name. I was still a member of Congress back then. I wasn't working for him. Uh, and, and he gets in there, and he's talking to Stephen Miller, his speechwriter. He says, Stephen, I don't remember the line. And he goes over the line. He says, I don't think you had that in there. He said, well, Mr. President, you, you actually covered that sort of, uh, you know, about 30 minutes into your speech. And so we just kind of skipped over that. He said, but it wasn't exactly the way it was written. And so he starts getting back in and he's telling Debbie and I, all, well, we're freaking out that, you know, he's sitting there critiquing line by line of everything that he had. So the other thing that reminds me, you know, we got this fan here. So a little secret, we would go to do all these rallies with President Trump and, you know, it was either very cold or very hot. Now, the president was, was concerned normally about the looks. He says, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, how cold it is, how hot it is. You know, he wanted to make sure that the wind was just right on his hair. And, and as we got all of that, he, he had it all just down. But the real secret was we would get there. We would be in these crowds. You get there early. And I can remember this one particular time we were, I think, up in Michigan and and it was so cold. I mean, it was bitter cold. The wind was blowing, and you know we're all bundled up. And he's out there just in his, you know, just in his jacket and with his red tie, blue jacket, red tie. He had the, you know, had the uniform on. And and we're going, how in the world is he out there? Well, secret. There is about a 12-inch pipe every time that he gives a speech that is even either giving air conditioning or heat. So he is there, and he's warm, and we're out there just chattering to death. And, and then he comes off and then starts saying, well, you know, what are you complaining for? You know, it's not that cold out here. Well, he's had it, you know, just going up uh, his pants leg the whole time and, and feeding it. So you, you get a little bit of that. But here, here's, I, I want to bring us back full circle a little bit. Here's the reason. You know, Joe, you touched on this because what happens is we get disappointed by politicians. You've all been there. You know, if you just write a check, send me to Washington or send me to Austin, I'll fix it for you. And what gets fixed is them. You know, they, they actually get your donation, they go, and then they don't act on it. And why, why I point that out is with school choice. I think Texas needs, that does need to be one of your top priorities. If there is a silver lining, I would agree, Gray, uh, you said this. If there was a silver lining to COVID, it did two things. It One, it let us know that you didn't have to actually be tied to the government school that your particular district was in order for your kids to be educated. But the other is, it showed us what was being taught in our classrooms. Parents for the first time said, I can't imagine that my kids are being taught this way. And so what do we need to do? We need to really focus on it, but we need to also understand who the enemy is. Because oftentimes the enemy is on our team. That's what I love about uh, TPPF. I mean, let, let me just tell you, there is not a greater think tank. You know, when you were talking about being there in Atlanta and you had all these groups coming uh, together, these state policy organizations, Guys, you need to feel real good about your investment. I mean, there is TPPF, and everybody else is way down the list. There is not a close second. And so I want to just say your investment is making a difference, not just here in Texas, but we work very closely at CPI. We have a very close relationship with the folks, uh, uh, actually, you know, as, as tenants uh, there on Capitol Hill. But here's the, here's the key. Do you realize that Washington, D.C. has more school choice than the state of Texas has? Now, is there any excuse in Austin why Washington, D.C. with Mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser and a whole bunch of Democrats would have more for school choice than the great state of Texas? I suggest not. I suggest not. But here's where the enemy is. And I can't speak to Austin, and I'm not about to come here from, 
you know, from the Carolinas or Washington, D.C. and tell you what's wrong with, with Texas politics. I will say the last time I was with you guys, you know, uh, there was a Senator-elect Sparks. Is he here? All right. Well, Senator, I mean, the last time I was here, you know, you were, you were actually trying to court votes. Now you're over there trying to sell them. I don't understand. No, no. But we are, we are very hopeful that you will set a new standard in Austin. But I can tell you the pressure is great. The minute he gets there, what will happen is, is they will ask him to join the club, of which none of you will ever be a member. I'm just here to tell you. They will, they will want him to not recognize you. They will want him, when he walks down the street, to look the other way because you're going to ask him something. But yet, here's what I would also suggest that the time is right for it truly to change. But I want to tell you a story because we potentially could have had some school choice with some of the COVID relief. If you think about it, you go back into the 20, you know, 20, we have a pandemic, we have, you know, it, it was a, it was not a good day. I, I became chief of staff in March about the time uh, I wasn't even officially in and they're closing down schools across the country. Dr. Fauci, uh, is uh, doing his anti-freedom march uh, up and down the Oval Office and back and forth in that corridor. But yet, yeah, here's what, what we saw, is with the COVID relief packages that you talk about, you know, they, they have all these unbelievable names for different packages that come. But there was close to $100 billion that was asked for for schools across the country. And, and a lot of that, they were saying, well, gosh, we've got these schools closed down. We're going to have to do all these kind of, of, of issues to open them back up to make sure that remote learning. In fact, they even came up and said it costs a lot more to do remote learning than it does to actually provide classrooms. I mean, now go figure, only in Washington, D.C. could Nancy Pelosi come up with saying, so I, I asked her, I said, so you're saying if we send somebody home and they're learning via Zoom, that that's more ex expensive than opening up a classroom and having all of them there and busing them all there. Oh, yeah, it, it's about twice as much. I, I said, well, you know, with that kind of logic, you know, I mean, how do we how do we operate? And so here was the interesting thing, and this is the, the other dose of reality I want to give you. We have this COVID relief package, $100 billion. We said, well, if we just come in here, what happens is, is I said, well, I may be willing to spend that if we will attach it to the student and let the students go anywhere. And this was the perfect time. They were closing down schools all over the country. In fact, there were schools that were open in certain places, not open in others. I said, if you want to send your child to a school that's open, let's let the money follow the student. It seemed like a real simple, simple thing. Guess where the biggest problem was? It wasn't Nancy Pelosi, although she was not in favor of it. Teachers Union was another one. But here's what happened. Two Republican senators on our side wouldn't support an initiative because they were afraid of the Teachers Union and the backlash that they would get from their more moderate colleagues. Now, here's the problem with that. If you have a once-in-a-lifetime shot and you got people on your team that you – they campaign for school choice, they talk about school choice, but when they were given a choice, they didn't pick it, that's a problem. You cannot let that happen here in Texas. I'm just here to tell you, you need to help them see the light, and if they can't, make them feel the heat, and if they don't feel the heat, show them the door. And I, I'm here to tell you, it is time that you do that, all right? Now, I am not here, I, I, you know, I've got grandkids, I love Winnie the Pooh, and I am not here to be Eeyore. I, I, I promise you, it's, I'm not here to be Eeyore. But I'm not here to be Tigger either. And so I want to let you know that as we look at this, what we have to do is make sure that we get it right. So sometimes we just have to poke a few people and remind them who they represent. 
That's what I love about this organization. You're gentle, you're firm, you're persistent. You know, uh, uh, you were talking about working in late at night, two o'clock, you know, three o'clock at, at, at night. You're, you're persistent, tenacious. All of those things provide for good policy. But here's the other time is sometimes we just have to re be reminded of who we represent. And uh, Texas, in particular, uh, is an underperforming state when it comes to that. And I'm, I can ta tell you from Washington, D.C., uh, we, we talk about all those subsidies, wind, solar, all those subsidies. Most of the Texas Republicans voted to extend those subsidies. Now, I say that without, I'm, I'm, I'm saying most, so that you can go home to your favorite member of Congress and uh, you know, say, well, Mark Meadows was trashing you. I, I didn't trash him by name. I could give you all the names. I know them very well. Uh, but, but here's when you're given an opportunity to do something, we shouldn't just extend those wind and solar uh, subsidies. Do you realize Texas is actually creating more wind and solar generating power this year by a factor of double, two times as much as the state of California? That's a problem. We need to get back to energy dominance and make sure that we're proud of American energy. And if it's an ESG problem, we need to tell those financial institutions that they can't, they can't work with our retirement programs at the government level, that if you're banking with them, let me tell you whether it's New York or anywhere else, it's time to get a new bank. Guys, this is all out war, and I can promise you it's coming to Texas. And it is time that we will win. Now, I will also share this. The reason why Texas and why TPPF is so critical is not just Austin, is everybody says, well, what if, what if it's with Florida? Why is Florida not the big influence? The largest Democrat caucus in Congress, in the halls of Congress, is from the state of California. More Democrat members in the House than any other state. The largest Republican caucus in Washington, D.C. comes from the great state of Texas. Yeah. It's not Florida, it's not Ohio, it's not any of those, it's the great state of Texas. So if Texas members will get together and vote as a block, guess what happens? Nothing can pass without them. And, and what we need to do is to make sure that the rhetoric matches their voting card. Now, I share that a little bit because, you know, it's, it's all about nudging. Now, I, I'm very cautious about nudging because here's the other issue. I, I'll, I'll tell you a personal story about Debbie and I. Uh, you know, so, you know, I go to church and, and we were there in church. And I'd had a late night and we were there in... Uh, uh, and, and, I, and I love my pastor. My, my pastor could really preach, and he was really good. And I was actually on the aisle and uh, sitting on the aisle looking straight up. We were only about 10 rows back, and so the pastor could see me pretty easily. And it had been a late night, and my wife was sitting next to me like she, uh, she does. And so my eyes started to drift off a little bit, you know. And, uh, and I, I was, you know, doing the nod and doing all of that. And... Uh, and so she would, you know, just kind of poke me just a little bit. I'm awake, I'm awake. You know, and, you know, as, as all of us do, I, I know there are no, no men in here who have ever said, oh, I'm perfectly awake when we got nudged by our wives. But I'm, I'm there and, you know, I'm starting to doze off again and she pokes me again and, and, and you know, I'm awake, I'm awake. Well, about the third time, I go down and I am. I'm literally, I'm literally, I'm, I'm not snoring, but I am out, you know, and, and so my wife realizes that I've gone into a deeper sleep, and she, 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 she pokes, and she kind of just gives it a push, you know, like right in my rib, you know, it, it just, well, I was almost asleep. It was like cow tipping. I almost went out in the aisle. My arms open up. We're not in a Pentecostal church, and I mean, I'm I'm there, and 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 I 
if I had fallen in the aisle, we would have had to change churches. I'm just here to tell you. But, but sometimes we just need to poke those that are our elected representatives. Sometimes what we have to do is make sure that we help them understand that we're there. Now, we also need to give compliments where compliments are due. And, I, and I'm here to tell you that as a member of Congress, I always heard from everybody when I messed up. Very rarely did I hear, hey, you know, I really like the fact that you were willing to stand up yesterday and I'm with you. The calls didn't come in near at the same volume. And, and, and yet, not let that fly over. I mean, for example, one of the good things that Governor Abbott has done just in the last day or so is to sign the executive order, which finally looked at drug cartels and treating them as terrorists. It's about time we do that. It is about time that we do that. And yet, at the same time, one good thing doesn't give a pass for everything else. And a lot of times, that's what we do. We, we get back and we say, well, gosh, if, if, if I call or if I don't call, let me just tell you, everybody in this room should be on the phone calling your state senator, calling your representative, calling your governor, your lieutenant governor, and doing it on a regular basis. Because I promise you, if you're not calling, someone else is. And normally what they're doing is calling with a different agenda, and they're just saying, well, if you, you, know, if you just kind of go along to get along, it's going to be okay. Now, here, here is... Uh, one other aspect that I would, I would love to share with you. As important as Texas is to the oil and gas industry, it's as important to America and all the other freedoms as well. Because what we have right now is we have an attack that is coming from California. How many of you read the other day that by 2035, no more gas uh, engine uh, automobiles will be sold in the state of California? Well, I mean, you, you know, you look at it and you go, well, only in California could that kind of crazy uh, mentality. Well, they did that right before they were having to do rolling blackouts because they don't have enough energy. So, you know, you, you, you want to say, what are they going to do, run an extension cord to Arizona? I mean, but, but at the same time, what we have to understand is, and I, I shared this earlier, there was an all-out war. It's not stopping in California, guys. That's already adopted by law because it has to be in Virginia. But there are 20 other states looking to ad adopt the California standard. And if they do that, what they will essentially do is put gas-powered automobiles off limits by 2035. Now, the good news is Texas is big enough and bold enough, and I believe it has the... Uh, intestinal fortitude, I'll say that uh, in that way, to actually get it done. So here's, here's what I would encourage you with. What I want you to understand is it always takes friction to create fire. And so if you think that all of a sudden what's going to happen is, is we can just be nice, and if we're nice enough long enough that everything is going to turn out okay, I can tell you that's not going to happen. Because what you're going to have to do is actually be bold, invest more in, in groups like TPPF, making sure that not only they have the right policy, but they have the right tactics, they have the right people. And when you look at this, it is all about making sure that someone has courage. Because we're, we, we don't lack the ideas. We don't even lack the ability to get it done other than Oftentimes, we lack courage. And yet, you look at all of you being successful business people, you've risked more than most people that ever come to Congress, and yet they take such little, uh, I guess, courage when it comes to it. They get up there, and all of a sudden, they blend in, and they act like everybody else. So here's my... Uh, I'll, I'll give you a prime example of this. Debbie and I... When I was chief of staff, we get with the president. The president is always a man of action, but he's, a, he's an unbelievable host as well. He always wants to make sure that every little detail is taken care of. And so I'm, I'm very early on 
chief of staff. I was there as the chief of staff, and uh, I, I come home. I tell Debbie, I said, Debbie, uh, we've got an invite to go to Camp David. Now, I never got one of those from Barack Obama, but, I mean, I was real, real happy that uh, we could go. And, and so very shortly, I found out, well, he said we could go in Marine One. Well, I mean, I'd never been in Marine One and never, you know, all I'd seen it was, a, you know, pictures that flew there. And, and the good thing is when you go to Camp David from the White House in Marine One, you make it in 20 minutes versus an hour and 35 minutes. Now, I know here in Texas, an hour and 35 minutes is just going to the local convenience store. But, uh, but it was, we, we get in there, so you got Debbie and I, and actually the way they sit, you know, so the president sits here facing forward. This seat normally is safe for Melania. She wasn't going, so Debbie got the seat sit right there in front of him. I'm sitting over on the side, and we have the uh, military aid that carries the nuclear football, the physician. So it's just a few of us, but you can carry on a normal conversation to Marine One. And so, so we take off, and we're going, and, and the president is trying to make sure that Debbie feels comfortable. That's the kind of guy he was, and, and many of you know him. Uh, you've met him, but he wanted to make sure that Debbie had this unbelievable experience. So over to the left there, you know, he has his Diet Coke, and, you know, he's a, a, a huge Diet Coke fan, and uh, it always has to have the right amount of ice, just the right amount of ice. If it gets too watered down, he gets another Diet Coke. And But he was taking pieces of gum. You know, they have all the gum and all the – and he'd say, you know, here, Debbie, you want a piece of gum? And so she, he's giving her the gum. Well, then they had these little – white matches that you can only get on Marine One. He says, uh, you know, so he takes a little white matches, has a gold Marine One. Here, Debbie, stick these in your purse. Make sure, you know, you know, don't sell them on eBay. Uh, all those kind of things. And so as, as we look at that, you know, he is really just trying to make her feel comfortable. And then he's so proud of the Marines. You know, he says, you know, these Marines, they're fine specimens, you know, and he, you know, he's all, you know, just how they all look great. And he says, watch this, Debbie, and we're starting to, to set down on the, uh, uh, there at Camp David. He says, you see those three points? He's, he's going to put these wheels right there on those three points, exactly on those three points. And sure enough, we, you know, we land there, and it, it is just picture perfect. So he's proud. He's proud of America, proud of who we are, and he wanted to share that. And, and so about that particular time, he reaches back. And he doesn't even say anything. It's, it's kind of like a racer on the, uh, you know, on a, on a relay race. It's like his hand went back, straight back, and, and uh, his body man slapped something in his hand, and it's actually a, a small can of hairspray. <laughs> so he, you know, the rotors are going, and he's going to shh, you know, getting all that. And my wife's sitting across from him, and he goes, leans it out, and she dips her head, and he squares hers all over. My wife tells her sister, he says, you mean the president of the United States, the leader of the free world, you know, hairsprayed your hair? I'm, I'm telling you, that's exactly what he did. That's, I share that because the personal side of who he is is not really uh, shown that much. And it's that personal side that I got to see up close and personal uh, where when the cameras weren't rolling, he was back behind the scenes thanking the men and women of law enforcement and our military, signing pictures, taking, you know, taking pictures with them, doing all of that, and, and yet was oftentimes demonized and continues to be demonized in the press. And I share that because here's what I want all of you to understand. When you've got people like Senator Sparks who are going to go up and make a difference in Austin, and you've got other people who are making a difference for you really standing up, it is important that you actually come around them and actually support them in a way that quite frankly, they can feel it and touch it and know. And, and I'm not talking about just writing them a check. I'm talking about sometimes writing them a note, sometimes making a call, sometimes just leaving a voicemail saying, I wanted to let you know I appreciate the fact that you made the right call. Because for every bad headline they will get, 
And let me just tell you, if school choice is actually going to happen in Texas, there will be all kinds of terrible headlines, not only about the elected representatives, but about TPPF as well. And so you as donors, I want you just to buckle up and be ready for it. And when that happens, I want you to double up what you're given because if they're getting the bad headlines, they're doing the right thing. I also want to close with this. Guys, let me just say, I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be here tonight. Debbie and I have friends that are here We've, we've been going through some very difficult times. Uh, and things that I wouldn't truly wish even on my enemies. But I can tell you that my Heavenly Father is there with me. I've been on my knees. Uh, and He has drawn us closer, closer to Him uh, than ever before because of the difficulties that we're facing. And so my prayer for all of you is as you face difficulties in the state of Texas and around the country that you realize how blessed we are. I shared with a group just the other day, as bad as it's been for us in some of the, the ongoing, uh, what I would say, residual of being chief of staff, I've got friends who have lost children. I've got friends that literally are fighting cancer and fighting for their life visited with one earlier today. I've got people that are single moms or single dads trying to do the best for their family. I've got people who have lost people and animals very close to them. And, and, and I've not had to experience any of that. I've been blessed by a wife who loves me and a Lord who protects me. And I want to let you know that no matter how bad it gets, that I promise you that our God still reigns over the affairs of nations and we will prevail. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think JB is going to moderate uh, any questions that you might have, and this is normally where it gets interesting. So if you, you know, if you'll just pick the right people, if it's a real tough yes. question, I'm going to let you answer it, JB. If it's real easy, I'll take it. Yes, please ask your questions. Uh, I was just one one thing. Mark is, like he said, has been through a lot. They've had death threats continuously, and they just Jesus soldier on. So thank you again you and Debbie for what you've done for our country. We really appreciate it. Thank you, God. Okay, it's a little hard to see. Who has questions? Clint, you have a question? Anybody? Any questions? Bob Bruce. Bob Bruce. Well, I don't, I don't want to get off topic, but with your connections and all you know what's going on in the movements around the nation, can you see any future just like we're working for school choice, for us to band together and start embracing the idea that we're spending too much on the green energy. We take that money away from the conversion of coal plants, no offense to Mr. Cole, to, and nat where I'm, what I'm trying to get to is natural gas turbine powered plants are a great solution to the Texas problem, the problem nationwide. Why aren't we talking about that? What's going on? Well, because it's a fossil fuel, Bob. I mean, it's a great question, but I can tell you that the, the enemy is, is really not about it going just after coal. And they're not about cleaning up the air, just to be frank. We have actually cleaned up the air more than the Kyoto Protocols cleaned up just by our use of natural gas. You know, Texas, I think the... Uh, the increase in, in generating power here in the state of Texas, about 13% this last year is what it would it would have been. But, you know, that compares to almost 40% for solar, 40% for wind, you know, and, and those are rounded numbers. But natural gas is so plentiful, that, you know, why, why haven't we learned from our mistakes? It's because there's a real agenda, and that real agenda is 
is trying to not only get us totally off of fossil fuels, but it's getting us totally dependent on an unreliable source of energy that, quite frankly, we don't even control. I mean, when you look at the rare earth minerals that, that have to go into everything that we do from battery storage to the way that we, you know, we produce the solar panels, you know, guess who owns all of that? China. And so we need to do a better job. But, you know, if you're on Capitol Hill and you say, well, let's just go with natural gas, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a religion to them. You know, to the left, it's a religion. And so what we've got to do is, is focus on that. We can do a better job. A lot of the, the plants are switching from, from coal to natural gas. I, I used to work for an electric utility that was 100% coal-fired generating uh, capacity uh, in Florida many years ago. And they've moved a lot of that to natural gas now. But, but even with that, that will not be enough. It, just like, you know, and to get into this, it was not enough just for them to make sure that the rights of homosexuals get protected. What they've done now is they want to make sure that girls do not have to compete necessarily with biological girls, and it doesn't stop there. The Air Force Academy is telling our, our airmen to basically quit using terms like mom and dad. You know, so, you know, here's my grandperson that came. You know, it's not my grandma or my grand. I mean, it's crazy, the woke mentality that is coming in. And what they're doing is trying to change the very fabric of who we are. Uh, they have a God in its government. And, and yet what we see as freedom-loving, liberty-loving people, we know that less government always works best because the free market and the free enterprise will always, always produce good results. But I wish it would, would, would help, but, but it is not a logical debate that you're in. And that's why we have to understand it's a real fight that defies logic. But it's a good question. <clears throat> Lindsay and I live in Fort Worth, and uh, TCU is a prominent university there, and they call their freshmen now fresh people. Uh, <laughs> Either fresh pe or, or first years, fresh people or first years. But anyway, any other questions? In that one. Yeah, Doug. Um, I think we're all, we all have one question, Mark, of you. We're all sitting around waiting and wondering if you're going to say something about it, and that is, are you going to run for president of the United States? <laughs> So let me, uh, true story, just uh, literally yesterday, uh, a, a guy from Texas was uh, at our annual conference, at CPI's annual conference, and uh, he was there and he came up to me and he said, uh, Mark, you know, you, you need to be uh, vice president or president, you know, we really want you. And I said, uh, uh, you know, I thought you were my friend. <laughs> uh, and, and he had a heart attack last night. True story. I mean, I mean, it, it, he's, he's doing fine, but, you know, it's one of those. So if you're mentioning that, I'd say check him into the ER right away. <laughs> uh, listen, we've got a lot of great candidates, but here's, here's the thing that, uh, you know, everybody always asks me, are we going to win in the midterms? I, I think we're going to win in the House. Uh, I do not think it'll be a red tsunami. I, I think we'll have about a 12-seat majority uh, in the House. Texas has solidified some of those congressional districts, but it hadn't really expanded a whole lot. You know, you, you've got great, great people like uh, Congresswoman Myra Flores that you're going to get to hear from. You know, listen, guys, I'm just the Zorbe before the entrees. You, you got Brooke Rollins, you got Congresswoman uh, Flores, uh, um, Senator Lee, you got Bill Barr. I mean, you got all these people coming in. And so let me just tell you, I'm going to give you all great questions to ask them. No. But, uh, but uh, you know, people want something that's different. It's why Governor DeSantis is doing so unbelievably well. You know, when, when 50 people showed up in Martha's Vineyard, you know, what happened to them? They got deported. They first got their food, but then they got deported. I mean, well, let, you know, would that work for Texas? Let's deport them, you know. And, and yet what we start to see is bold leadership like that starts to show the hypocrisy of others. Because uh, uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser in Washington, D.C., when the first busload got there, 
She said, well, this is not, you know, we, we can't handle this. The second one, oh, she went crazy, started asking for emergency relief. When that got denied, she asked for it again. But, but they show that they want to be sanctuary cities until the sanctuary actually gets occupied. You know, and, and they're not a border state. They haven't had to deal with it like you have. And so, listen, there's going to be a lot of great candidates. Uh, you know, Texas is, you know, in a position to influence all of that, you know, quite frankly. And so uh, thank you for your your leadership. You know, I think last time I saw you may have been in the White House. But uh, but as we look at this, I want to, want to close by a heartfelt. Debbie and I will be praying for TPPF. We will be praying for all of you. And I want you to know, do not grow weary in well-doing because you're making a difference. God bless you.